Hi, this is Tracy to the Homo Spinoza, and this week we're going to be looking at neuroplasticity or the flexibility that your brain has to learn new things. We're going to look at this in the same context as the other themes that we've talked about in Mind, Brain, Health, and Education through a transdisciplinary lens, and then we're going to look at some different definitions of neuroplasticity. We will consider the idea of critical periods versus sensitive periods here, and then explore this through three different case studies that come from the Deutsch book. Then we'll round this out by looking at protective factors as well as risk factors that could influence neuroplasticity in your brain. Starting then from the transdisciplinary perspective, we have to keep in mind the environment that one lives in, uh, the genetic makeup or your biology, so this is your nature and nurture, and how this manifests itself in the way your brain is structured. So we're going to keep in mind uh, epigenetics and the interplay then between your genes and the environment or nature versus nurture throughout the entire discussion. It's very important that we keep in mind of the relationship between plasticity, genes, and environment. Uh, we know that you're born with a certain genetic makeup that you inherit from your parents and you live in a specific environment. Based on your genes, you will react to your environment in distinct ways. We'll look at this as in week 15 further as we consider cultural neuroscience. But the bottom line is that human potential is based and your genetic interactions with the environment that you live in. When we talk about plasticity in the brain, there are two big categories of cases that come up. The first has to do with recuperation or restructuring, and this has to do with somebody, for example, who might have lost existing capabilities due to a stroke, for example, and how do they recuperate, and how is the brain plastic enough or flexible enough to adapt to new structures or new situations. And the second type of neuroplasticity has to do with just new learning. How does new learning occur in the brain, which is also uh, the results of neuroplasticity. So we're going to try to look at a couple of examples from each of these two different types. One very key example, or one example that many of you might be familiar with, has to do with strokes. Two big groupings of strokes. You can have a stroke in which you have hemorrhage in the brain, or where you have clot that blocks something in the brain, right? It can either atrophy whole parts of the brain, or at the least interrupt the normal communication between those parts of the brain and the networks that they are related to. Another example of uh, recuperating a lost skill comes from traumatic brain injury. Unfortunately, we have fewer cases of full recuperation based on traumatic brain injury than we do from stroke, simply because stroke is very isolated and happens in a specific area, whereas traumatic brain injury uh, tends to happen um, over long periods of time and repeated um, damage to specific areas, making it much more difficult to recuperate. But there are cases that have to do with levels of plasticity related to traumatic brain injury as well. Also related to restructuring in the brain are groups of studies that have to do with therapy or therapeutic changes or things that happen to the brain or new plasticity based on therapy or therapeutic interventions. For example, we now can move many things that happen in the field of psychology or psychiatry into more hard science structure related to neuroscience because we can actually measure changes in the brain based on therapeutic interventions. An example of this will post uh, traumatic stress disorder or, or other learned fears uh, in which uh, a person can attend therapeutic sessions and what they really have to do, which is, uh, this explains why some therapies can last years, is that they actually have to break old connections and then reestablish new connections, much harder than learning something um, new from scratch, right? So when we talked about the heavy and synapse hypothesis, uh, the neurons that fire together wire together, right? So if you have a tone and a uh, bad experience that come together, that can create um, a, a fearful memory for the individual. However, you can have just the fearful experience by itself or just the tone by itself and neither of those will cause a fearful memory or in other individuals you can have just one or the other and that will create a fearful memory so depending on the individual depending on the other prior experiences that are connected with those particular sets of neurons or those pathways related to fear an individual will experience or express a fearful reaction to the situations the key big idea here is that all learning is a result of plasticity, good and bad. We might be able to observe this little girl looks like she just had a light bulb moment and she's getting it, right? So we can observe behavior that says this kid gets it, she has learned something. But we will have physiological evidence in the neuroplasticity in her brain. You can measure how that has increased when she has a learning moment. When we define terms then, if we talk about developmental plasticity, then we talk about developmental stages of the individual. So there are different levels of plasticity during our lifetime, across our lifetime. So developmental plasticity is a term um, that refers to the general changes in neural connections during development based on interaction with the environment. So from the time that your brain is newly formed, we go from 25 days here all the way developing through nine months of development. And then when that baby is born and then grows into a, a child, an adolescent, and a young adult, old adult, and an aged person, 
um, there are different levels of plasticity that are associated with that. And we see that during gestation, uh, more or less starting around three months of age all the way until the child is born, there's a neural migration in which the cells in the brain migrate to distinct parts. And so those that are meant to be part of the visual cortex or motor cortex, uh, frontal lobes, they'll migrate to the different areas where they're meant to do their jobs. Um, and this is where we can actually find some difficulties. There are some uh, learning problems associated with uh, genetics, and there are some people who are prone to have certain neural migrations uh, blocked or not occur correctly. For example, individuals with dyslexia, uh, around the fifth month of gestation, there are certain neural cells that should migrate to be part of Broca's area, Wernicke's area. They should migrate to these different language areas of the brain. Uh, unfortunately, there's um, sometimes a grouping of these cells, and these are called ectopic cells, and they might block the normal neural connections between key areas of the brain related to uh, language learning, which would result in dyslexia. We know that myelination, uh, synaptogenesis, we know that new connections in the brain begin as soon as those neurons are in place, so that you, you will actually have new connections in the brain very early on mainly timed more or less when sensory organs are kicking into place. So a child can perceive changes in color and can begin to hear more or less around five months of gestation. And about that time, you'll begin to see new neural connections based on that. Myelination, as we explained before last week, is the speed with which groups of neurons connect with each other or can communicate with each other based on the strength of the synapses that are formed. So the synapses with enough rep repetition will create the smiling sheath around that neural connection, making speedier retrieval between those different parts of the brain. All of these stages, myelination, synaptogenesis, all of this will continue throughout the lifespan and on into old age. So as I mentioned before, yes, we can see, we can document, and you can see increases in this myelination, in white matter tracts in the brain, which will be evidence of neuroplasticity and motor learning in the brain, for example. You can also see general intellectual ability and changes in the brain based on that, uh, strengthening of neural connections as evidenced by the functional connectivity and brain plasticity. So brain plasticity basically in its grand definition has to do with these new connections that you find in the brain. So neuroplasticity is really the connectivity between distinct areas of the brain or areas of the brain that hadn't before been connected. So as we mentioned in the, in the second slide uh, related to context and the transdisciplinary way of looking at plasticity, plasticity doesn't just have to do with the synapses or the neurophysiology of the brain, but it also has to do with your genetic makeup. So you have a genotype. You were born with um, around 30,000 genes, okay? Your phenotype is your outward appearance. It's how those genes manifest themselves within the context of your environment and only use actually a fraction of all of the genes or the genetic potential that you actually have. So based on certain genotypes, there is a distinct uh, plasticity range for different types of learning. So different people are born with different potentials to be able to learn new or different types of things. Phenotype plasticity, uh, distinct from genotype plasticity, it's the way the potentiation of your genes changes over time based on the context of your environment. So, so when the environment lends itself to a new type of learning, this is something that will be passed on in your genes and potentiated for future generations. This long-term change then are the epigenetic influences on plasticity. This, I, I love this teacher. The, the general argument between nature and nurture, <laughs> either way it's your parents' fault. So the context in which you're born or the genes with which you're born um, will influence your potential to have neuroplasticity or to have new learning for different types or in different domain areas. When we talk about other definitions of neuroplasticity, we talk about types of plasticity. So there's training-induced plasticity, and training regimens are important to new learning. The amount of repetition that is created will strengthen the connection between distinct neuronal groups which will fortify different pathways. So depending on how frequently you train in a new learning domain, you'll have different results related to the level of plasticity that's achieved. We also know that mechanisms of learning um, actually change with domains. So you cannot just, you know, kill and drill and teach. You might be able to teach the multiplication tables in that way, but you can't teach other types of things with the same mechanism. So different domain areas, different types of learning require different types of repetition and training. And there are key determinants to learning, which are very clear. The level of difficulty that, uh, of, a, of the new learning skill is very important. Uh, human beings like things that are just a little bit more difficult than they can do by themselves. Those of you who are in psychology understand uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, in which uh, individuals actually uh, grow fastest uh, 
when they are in a context and they are guided by um, a type of a mentor or somebody who can actually stretch them a little bit beyond what they can already do by themselves. So the level of difficulty is very important in, in explaining um, the speed with which an individual can learn a new thing. Prior experience is key to learning, as we talked about last week. All new learning passes through the filter of prior experience. So, without, uh, so the level of prior experience of an individual will have a deep influence or an impact on the level of plasticity that's achieved over time. The level of motivation, because motivation is directly related to the amount of repetition or practice that a person will invest in a new learning activity. Uh, feedback, how the people around you uh, give you feedback about your learning process is directly related to motivation, which is directly related to repetition. And again, human variability. Different people, different genotypes will be able to react to different types of challenges in distinct ways. Um, if I was asked to run a marathon genetically, I was born in a way that will lend itself or not lend itself to certain types of learning, motor learning, cognitive learning, or otherwise. And we'll talk about this again when we talk about cultural neuroscience. Another way to look at definitions has to do with uh, this concept of experience-dependent plasticity, a different type of plasticity. So we talk about, uh, and this is again with the example of, of motor-dependent uh, plasticity. So the more you practice something, the stronger the connections, but not only that, you can have greater amounts of the cortex dedicated to that based on the variability of the different moves that you make. So if I just learned to play chopsticks on the piano, I will have a certain, you know, certain pathways formed. But if I learn to... Um, be somebody who can improvise on the piano, those are distinct but overlapping pathways in the brain. So there'll be a greater amount of real estate dedicated to that particular skill in my brain. So another example of motor dependent plasticity would be learning to play the violin, for example. So you have a stimulus, your brain is telling you what to do, send signals, and based on the level of practice, certain areas of the brain will be strengthened, 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 strengthened. There are some classic examples of studies in which somebody does a spatial learning, for example, or spatial orientation in those areas of their cortex grow. We can measure these in many different ways. We talked a little bit about TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation in the last class. You can actually measure changes in the motor cortex based on new learning situations. Another way to look at plasticity or divine plasticity has to do with sleep-dependent plasticity. Plasticity, a fascinating area that we're going to look at when we talk about the mind-body connection. There's a combination of neurotransmitters that exist in the brain only during REM sleep, rapid eye movement, or when most of your dreams are occurring. And this combination of neurotransmitters permits the consolidation of long-term memory. So we know that a kid can show up in your class and say that they have studied all night long and, you know, they get a good grade on the test. But you ask them the same question 24 hours later, and because they haven't really slept on it, that did not consolidate into a long-term memory. That kid basically maintained things in a, in a type of working memory long enough to you know, get his answers out on the page, but he did not really learn long-term, so there was no long-term memory created. So we know that in order to really learn something new, um, there is such a thing as sleep-dependent plasticity. Without sleep, there will be no um, evidence of real learning. Okay, now we can go to some sticky questions. Is there a critical period for plasticity? And as with all things in this new field, we have to say, well, it depends. Uh, there is no critical period for anything that's learned academically. However, there is evidence for a critical period related to sense perception. For example, I don't know if you recall those cats. I couldn't find one of these horrible pictures, but here's a, a cat with an eye patch where they sewed little kitten's eyes shut. And then, you know, after a certain amount of period, even though they unsewed the eyes, that connection between being able to perceive sense perception and, and what's going on in the brain was lost. So we believe that there's a, a critical period related to sense perception. We also, but for lack of evidence, cannot be 100% sure, believe that there's a sensitive period for um, gross motor skills. Unfortunately, the evidence comes from the terrible cases, for example, of the Romanian refugees who were found to either tied or strapped to their beds or cribs for years, basically didn't go out, didn't, uh, weren't able to move around a lot, didn't have a lot of physical space to maneuver. They would be taken out of the situation, say they're five years old, they're adopted by a nice loving family in, in another place, given a huge garden and encouraged to play. But their physical uh, motor skills were stunted. And many of these kids, most of these kids, would never reach 100% of what they could or should be at age-appropriate levels. We also believe that there may be a critical period for first language acquisition. Although it is totally unethical to, you know, try this. I can't, like, you know, borrow your newborn son and put them 
uh, in a forest and, and have them be brought up with wolves for eight years and then bring them back and test and see if you can in develop language. We can't do this ethically, and there's very few cases, a couple hundred cases of feral children, but they do indicate that there are uh, sensitive periods for learning your first language. Um, these are earlier periods. So, for example, a kid who might have been lost. Um, let's say he grew up and he was three years old, four years old, then got lost in, in a forest or in the jungle for you know six, seven years, but then was brought back. That kid actually could recuperate language. But then other kids who at earlier ages, say one, two years old, were sent to out and to live with the dogs or whatever, even though they would be rescued after a shorter period of time, say only three years uh, in that context, had a very a much harder time recuperating language skills. So we believe that there is a sensitive or even perhaps critical period for developing first language skills in individuals. So connecting this all back to plasticity, when we look at the level of um, how many neurons that you have, the synapses that are created, and myelin sheath and how it grows, and the amount of glia cells, or this is kind of like the glue cells that stick everything together there, these have a fluctuation, they have been well documented, and there are peaks and valleys here. They mainly relate to early learning and a lot of the physical learning and language learning that's done in the early years. But, it, but it's very key to um, recognize that the reorganization of synapses and plasticity itself, which is really learning, occurs throughout the lifespan. Having said that, you have to take all of this with a grain of salt things get harder along the way, mainly because when we, can, when we talk about neuroplasticity, it does exist. But breaking an old habit to get into a new habit of things or learning something new as we get older, teaching an old dog new tricks, does get harder along the way. Although you can learn throughout the lifespan. People do learn throughout the lifespan. But the effort uh, required is higher because you are having to break old habits or old neural pathways before you can construct new ones over that. So when we talk again about critical versus sensitive periods, we think that there may be a critical period related to some sensory perception things. If you are deprived of sight in the early years, even though we might allow you to be able to see a few years later or open up your eyes a few years later, you will have lost that early connection. We also sense that there is a critical period related to your first language. But related to higher cognitive abilities, the ability to learn a second language, for example, or math, or to learn how to read, there does not appear to be a critical period for higher cognitive abilities. So this means that it's, there's probable critical period in gestation in the early years that's related to toxic stress and nutrition. A mother under high stress situations, poor nutrition, who is exposed to drugs during pregnancy can give birth to a child with poor brain architecture, right? So um, this is leading us to believe, based on the few cases that exist, a possible critical period for first language and for gross motor skills. However, there seems not to be a critical period for anything learned in school, reading, math, science, art, history. However, there is a probable sensitive period for foreign accents. So if you're learning a second language in high school or as an adult, uh, you may have a stronger accent, which has a lot to do with sensory perception. You can't have a good accent if you can't perceive the sound. So in the early years, if your sensory perception, if you've been deprived of hearing all the phonemes in a target language, the likelihood of having an accent is higher. So there's some seven big principles that come out of this. We know that there are microscopic changes in the brain that will occur before you will see behavioral changes. We talked about that last week as well. We know that the brain can change at any age for good or bad. This means that neuroplasticity is not always a good thing. And we know that plasticity lasts throughout the lifespan. We also know that the brain is altered by a wide range of experiences. And no two individuals are going to react to those experiences in the same way due to their genetic makeup. We also know that early events do make a difference. Your mother's good nutrition during pregnancy is, is why you have the wonderful brain potential you have right now. But we also know that if your mother was under heavy levels of toxic stress or if she had been living in a very bad neighborhood and was under a high level of anxiety the whole time, that can have an impact on your potential to learn in the future. We also know that neuroplasticity varies with age and the effort with which it takes to learn things increases throughout the lifespan. We know there's an infinite number of individual experiences, which means there's an infinite number of possibilities of levels of performance of individuals based on their unique genetic makeup. And we know that lifelong neuroplasticity has a major consequence for brain health and fitness. And this enables us to prevent further decline and provide support for enhancing habilitation and rehabilitation. So we know that Older people who take on new learning tasks, this is the idea of use it or lose it, right? Older people who keep their brains active are less likely to go into cognitive decline at an earlier age than people 
who do nothing. So keeping active, uh, using your brain, is actually a way to prevent uh, that cognitive decline. Okay, so we want to share three interesting case studies that come out of uh, Norman Deutschbrook on the brain that changes itself. In the first case, we have Cheryl Diltz, and for five years she had an impairment due to damage in her vestibular system, which has to do with balance. She could not uh, keep herself standing up. She would fall down constantly. This was caused by taking a certain antibiotic she didn't realize that she would have a reaction to, and this um, deteriorated the inner ear structure that she had, which caused the problem to the vestibular system, which caused her problem with balance. Um, as a result of this, you know, she lost her job, she felt like she was a worthless human being, there was no quality of life, uh, it was very draining on her mentally, strong impacts on her memory and attention, and a general fear, you know, of death, dying, and getting old. So what happened with her? There was an amazing intervention that was uh, conducted by Paul Brocky Rita, who said that we're, we see with our, our brains, not with our eyes. And so he did a lot of experiments that had to do with sensory systems. So he used what was called an accelerometer, which was a strip. It looks like kind of a piece of, a piece of scotch tape with little sensors on them. And what these sensors did was, based on a reading from the external environment, she could use her tongue to see. So what's the big idea here? You learn about your world through your senses. Baki Rita hypothesized then that if one of your sensory systems, in this case her ear, was not working correctly, then he could help her perceive and learn about her world through another sense, sensory perception of her tongue. So what did this do? This allowed her to become upright again, to stand again, to work, walk, and she basically recovered after a short-term use of this. So what are the big ideas that come out of this? The simple physiological deficit that she had in her ear really had a huge impact on her emotional life, on her behavior in general, on her work life, on her general well-being, on her, on her psychological state, uh, and on her social relationships. So we know that uh, any one of these uh, things being out of sync has an impact on the others. So there's a huge holistic impact that we have to look at when we evaluate an individual. It's not just her ear that had a problem. We have to look at all of the different pieces of what makes her today. We also learned from this experiment then that the vestibule and the visual systems are connected. So sensory input systems are connected in the brain. They can be used. So when the wiring from one thing is not connected or not working correctly, then we can use input from another sensory mode to replace or to assist in a sensory mode that's been damaged. This leads to the conclusion that you can circumvent one sense with another, or at least in Cheryl's case, she was able to do this, right? And finally, perseverance matters. She could have lost all the hope, but she took the initiative, was able to talk to and work with uh, Paul Bakirita's laboratory, uh, get herself back on her feet again, literally. Um, and if you'd like to see more about her particular story, you can see uh, this YouTube video that summarizes what she went through. In a second case expressed in the book, which is fascinating, this has to do with Paul Bakirita's father. Pedro. This is Paul Bakirita. This is not his father, and this is him as well explaining his basic concepts of neuroplasticity. But what happened with Paul Bakirita's father? Paul and his brother were studying medicine when their father, Pedro, had a stroke. He basically couldn't move the muscles in his face. You know, his right half of his body was immobile. He couldn't stand. He was unable to walk because the right side of his body was immobilized. And he got what most people get, in, at least in the United States, you know, this kind of... Uh, here's a month worth of therapy, six weeks worth of therapy, this is as good as it gets, take your dad home. But Paul and his brother George uh, decided they were young medical students and they didn't really know any better, so they refused to sort of accept this. So they took their dad home and they cleared out a room and they made their father literally crawl around the room, like push himself up against the side of the wall and learn to identify his body again. They made him wash pots, you know, so that he can understand the perimeters of his space. Um, they did intense speech therapy, and um, they basically found that within um, a little more than uh, a year of this intense therapy, this fellow started to look normal again. You know, he remarried, and he lived uh, to be 72 years old, and when he died, you know, what did they do? But like good med students, they asked for dad's brain, right? They wanted to see what had gone on in there. And the, and the autopsy that they did on their father showed that there was a huge lesion in the brain stem. 97% of the nerves that connected into the brain, they had been destroyed. That Broca's and Wernicke's area, which are key to language, you know, gone. Um, and he had actually learned, though, to 
speak and walk and behave 99% normal. So once uh, these fellows uh, actually saw inside their brain, Paul Bakirita and his brother came to some really amazing conclusions. One thing that had never been shown before, but that plasticity goes into old age. Uh, an older brain, a 65-year-old fellow, can learn to speak again. He can learn to walk again. He could learn to act normal again, um, starting really from scratch, because a third to a, a quarter to a third of his entire you know, left hemisphere of his brain had gone in that stroke. Uh, we also know that normal life experiences, not you know, fancy uh, physical therapy um, that occurs in, in expensive hospitals is necessary. Normal life experiences can be used to uh, motivate recover the recovery process. So just picking up coins, uh, rolling balls, washing pots actually help to increase um, his finding motor skills. And that we understand that late rehabilitation is possible. Um, it's not just, okay, he's, he's that old, we've tried therapy for six weeks post-stroke, he'll never get better. There is the potential that you could get better with uh, intense uh, intervention, intense therapy. What was happening here has to do with this first type of neuroplasticity we talked about, about recuperation or restructuring. Old pathways that had been used to speak before or to walk before had been destroyed. So what had to happen is new pathways have to be forged. Um, we'll talk about this in more detail if it's of interest, but many times you find stroke recovery patients, you'll find that there's an increased uh, white matter connection in actually the parallel areas. So if Broca and Wernicke's area were gone in, in Pedro's case, you found that there's actually an increase in white matter development and new connections in parallel areas of the other hemisphere. So we see that there is a way that the brain will rewire itself, um, that there's potential for this to occur. Obviously, there's a lot of hard work, a lot of intensive therapy, a huge amount of repetition, uh, and also the energy and motivation on the part of the patient to do so, but it is possible. This is why perseverance also matters. In the third case, we have Barbara Aerosmith Young, who is a woman who was born with lots of problems, and she was basically told by professionals that, you know, she was going to be slow for life and so sorry for you, and she had terrible deficits. She was born without the ability to tell time or discriminate right from left or understand cause and effect or certain types of symbol systems. She, she had very awkward social interactions. Um, it, I'm going to let her and her own words um, explain this to you as we look at um, this short video clip related to her case study. I want to share a little secret, which I hope will not be a secret by the end of the talk. I am truly, madly, deeply passionate about the human brain. Science has taught us that our brain shapes us, that it makes us uniquely who we are. And if we think about our brain, it has 200 billion neurons. Think about the world's population. That's a mere 7 billion. And we have hundreds of trillions of connections in our brain. If we imagine all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, there are more connections in our brain than all of those stars combined. So this incredibly complex organ that we carry with us everywhere we go, it does shape who we are. It is a filter. It filters our perceptions and our understanding of ourselves, of others, of our world, and of our place in that world. And what is incredibly amazing is no two brains are exactly alike. If you look at the person next to you and you note all the physical differences between you, the shape of your nose, the color of your eyes, your height, there are more differences between your two brains than all of those physical differences in combination. So our brain does make us uniquely us. And I'm here today to share with you my story. And it's the story of how I came to learn that not only does our brain shape us, but that we can actually shape our brain. And my story began in grade one. And in grade one, I was identified as having a mental block. I was told I had a defect. And I was told I would never learn like other children. And really, the message at that time was loud and clear. 
I was told I needed to learn to live with those limitations. And this was 1957, and it was the time of the unchangeable brain. And childhood was a profound struggle for me. I couldn't tell time. I couldn't understand the relationship between an hour hand and a minute hand on a clock. I couldn't understand language. Most of what I read or heard was really as intelligible as the Jabberwocky. I could understand concrete things. If somebody said to me, the man is wearing a black coat, I could paint a picture in my head, and I could understand that. But what I couldn't do was understand concepts or ideas or relationships. So lots of things were confusing. I pondered, how could my aunt also be my mother's sister? And what did that fraction, one over four, really mean? Any kind of abstract concept was hard for me. Irony in jokes, that was impossible. So I learned to laugh when other people did. Cause and effect, it did not exist in my world. There were no reasons behind why things happened. My world was a series of disconnected bits and pieces of unrelated fragments. And eventually, my fragmented view of the world ended up causing a very fragmented sense of myself. And that wasn't all. This whole left side of my body was like an alien being, unconnected to the rest of me. I would bang and bump into things on the left side of my body. If I picked up anything in this left hand, I would drop it. If I put this left hand on a hot burner, I would feel pain, but I had no idea where it was coming from. I was truly a danger to myself. My mother, she was convinced I would be dead by the age of five. And then, but that wasn't enough, I had a spatial problem. I couldn't imagine three-dimensional space. I couldn't create maps in my head. I would constantly get lost, even in my friend's house. Crossing the street instilled terror. I could not judge how far away was that car. Geometry was a nightmare. I felt incredible shame. I felt there was something horribly, horribly wrong with me. And in my child's mind, when I'd heard that diagnosis of having a mental block, I actually thought I had a wooden cube in my head that made learning difficult. And I didn't have a piece of wood in my head, but I wasn't far wrong. I had blockages, as I was later to learn, in very critical parts of my brain. And I tried all the traditional approaches. They were all about compensation and about working around the problem, finding a strength to support a weakness. They were not about trying to address the source of the problem. And they took heroic effort and led to rather limited results for me. Then, grade eight, I hit the wall. I could not imagine how I could go on to high school and handle more complex curriculum. The only option I could see was ending my life. So I decided to end the pain. And the next morning, when I woke up after my failed suicide attempt, I berated myself for not even being able to get that right. So I soldiered on, and part of what kept me going was an attitude that I learned from my father. He was an inventor, and he was passionate about the creative process. And he taught me that if there's a problem and there's no solution, you go out and create a solution. And the other thing he taught me was that before you can solve a problem, you have to identify its nature. So I can. passionate about the creative process. And he taught me 
that if there's a problem and there's no solution, you go out and create a solution. And the other thing he taught me was that before you can solve a problem, you have to identify its nature. So I continued my hunt. I went on to study psychology to try to understand what was wrong with me, what was the source of my problem. And then in the summer of 1977, something life-altering happened. I met a mind like my own, a Russian soldier, Leova Zazetsky. The only difference being his mind was shaped by a bullet and mine had been that way since birth. I met Zazetsky on the pages of a book, The Man with a Shattered World, written by the brilliant Russian neuropsychologist Alexander Luria. As I read Zazetsky's story, he couldn't tell time. He described living in a dense fog. All he got was fragments, bits and pieces. This man was living my life. So now, at the age of 25, in 1977, I knew the source of my problem. It was a part of my brain in the left hemisphere that wasn't working. And then I came across the work of Mark Rosenschweig, and he showed me a solution. Rosenschweig was working with rats, and he found that rats in an enriched and stimulating environment were better learners. And then when he looked at their brains, their brains had changed physiologically to support that learning. And this was neuroplasticity in action. Neuroplasticity, simply put, the brain's ability to change physiologically and functionally as a result of stimulation. So now I knew what I had to do. I had to find a way to work, to exercise my brain, to strengthen those weak parts. And this was the beginning of my transformation and of my life's work. And I had to believe that humans must have at least as much neuroplasticity and hopefully more than rats. So I went on to create my first exercise and I used clocks because clocks are a form of relationship and I had never been able to tell time. So I started with a two-handed clock to force my brain to process relationships. And then I added a third hand and then a fourth hand because I wanted to make my brain work harder and harder and harder to pull together concepts and understand their connection. And about three to four months in, I knew something significant had changed. I'd always wanted to read philosophy and had never been able to understand it. And I just happened to have access to a philosophy library. So I went in and I pulled a book off the shelf and I opened it to a page at random and I read that page and I understood it as I was reading it. This had never happened in my entire life. And then I thought maybe it's a fluke. Maybe that was just an easy book. So I pulled another book off the shelf, opened it, read it and understood it. And by the time I was finished, I was surrounded by a pile of a hundred books and I had been able to read and understand each page. So I knew that something had changed. My experiment had worked. The human brain was capable of change. And then I decided to create an exercise for that alien part of my body. And for that, I knew I had to work on an area in the right hemisphere, the somatosensory cortex that registers sensation. I created an exercise for that, and I am no longer a danger to myself. And then I decided that spatial problem because I was really tired of getting lost. And so I created another exercise for that. And I don't get lost. I can actually read maps. I don't like GPSs because I like to read maps now because I can. Um, so I knew now the brain could change. I was living proof of human neuroplasticity. And what really <laughs> breaks my heart is that I still meet people today, children, individuals that are struggling with learning problems, and they're still being told what I was told in 1957, that they need to learn to live with their limitations. They don't dare to dream. And what I've learned since 
1977 when I met Dzetsky and Luria and Rosenschwag, is that yes, our brain does shape us. It impacts how we can engage and participate and, and be in the world. And every single one of us has our own unique profile of cognitive strengths and weaknesses. And if there's a limitation, we don't necessarily have to live with it. We now know about neuroplasticity and we can harness the brain's changeable characteristics to create programs to actually strengthen and stimulate and change our brain. And in 1966, Rosenschwag threw down a gauntlet. He said his challenge was, let's take what he learned with rats and apply it to human learning. And we need to embrace that challenge. We need to also challenge current practices that are still operating out of that paradigm of the unchangeable brain. We need to work together to take what we know now about neuroplasticity and develop programs that actually shape our brains to change the future of learning. My vision is of a world that we create in which no child has to live with the ongoing struggle and pain of a learning disability. My vision is that cognitive exercises become just a normal part of curriculum. My vision is that school becomes a place that we go to strengthen our brain, to become really efficient and effective learners engaged in the learning process, where not only as learners can we dare to dream, but we can realize our dream. And to me, this is the perfect marriage between neuroscience and education. Thank you. A truly inspirational story. So what are the big ideas that we can take away from Barbara's story? Basically, well, she's created this wonderful school. If you're interested uh, in checking out her webpage and the way that she works with uh, kids who who nobody else wants to uh, work with, kids who have learning problems who've been told what she was told, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Hers is a very inspirational case, and hopefully um, some of you will choose to explore her webpage and see what her intervention is all about. But what were the things that she basically pulled from this? That her breakthrough moment was when she realized that her problem was physical. There was a physiological blockage of what normal routes would be in learning. And she had to somehow get over that. So that was a big breakthrough moment for her. She also realized, just like Pedro Bacchirita um, had to realize, is that there was a constant rehearsal and practice with certain types of tasks that restructure connections that she had not had before. So in her case, it was new learning. In Pedro's case, it was restructuring or learning how to talk again or walk again. In Barbara's case, she was creating new connections because she had to bypass some blockage in her brain, something that had not been connected correctly from the beginning. So she had to find a new pathway. What's fascinating about Paul Bakirita's work and the way he explained things is that um, it's, it's almost like a road. You know, you, you normally get from point A to point B by taking whatever road. So let's say you normally get from Cambridge to Boston, you know, crossing the, the Mass Ave Bridge, okay? But what happens if the Mass Ave Bridge is closed that day? Well, you'll have to go over the BU Bridge, or you have to take another bridge, or you'll have to go some other way. So the idea is that after enough times of doing that, that actually might become your preferred route. And so you won't even have to think about it. It's been uh, plugged in so much, you won't even have to think about which road to take because there will be a new path already set there. So things become habituated because they've had so much rehearsal. So another big idea is that your brain is capable of rewiring itself on multiple levels. As we saw in the first case of Cheryl Schultz when she had a sensory perception deficit that caused all of these difficult problems. And then we look at, in Barbara Aerosmith's case, where she actually had higher cognitive difficulties, um, there are many levels of learning that can take place, all dependent on plasticity. And this neuroplasticity, the simple fact that your brain can rewire itself or can be taught to rewire or can learn new pathways um, in order to make those connections, um, I hope that these cases, um, I hope you find them as inspirational as I do. Okay, a handful of more big ideas. 
Um, as we mentioned earlier, plasticity can be good and it can be bad. As hopefully will become really apparent, your brain adapts to what it does most. If your brain is constantly bombarded with stimulus and quick changes of fast-paced video games or computer things or television shows that move around so much, your brain will adapt to that. Um, this is, you know, luckily this is part of evolution. Your brain adapts to what it does most. Unfortunately, this can lead to negative learning or bad results. For example, uh, racism, sexism, things that have occurred so many times because of that rehearsal, we have a link uh, in our mind between certain situations and certain outcomes and the way we should feel or act about them. So plasticity is not all good, okay? Plasticity is learning, but learning is not all good. So some things you can learn and habituate over time, but they're not necessarily positive or a positive force for society or for the individual. So finally, we want to close with some ideas about protective and risk factors again. If you'll recall in the introduction, we talked a bit about how um, everything that's a protective factor actually is also a risk factor. So your own community, uh, the genes you were born with, uh, the people, the teachers in your school community, all of these things are protective and risk factors. Uh, one way to look at this is that there are some factors that affect brain plasticity that have been looked at and there's a lot of research behind, which has to do with uh, enrichment programs. If you recall, Errol Smith um, talked about Rosenberg's uh, project with rats and how they put them in enriched environments a sensory motor stimulus um, or, or deprivation. All of these things uh, relate to brain plasticity. But now we're also looking at other types of factors that can enhance or decrease plasticity, uh, including migration, you know, moving to different places, uh, the culture in which you live in, the type of education you receive, literacy rates. So there's a lot of different ways to approach uh, factors that influence or impact brain plasticity. And we know that everybody is born, you know, you, there's a potential. Everybody has a potential. Your brain is plastic, it's ready to make new connections. But if it doesn't have the right stimulus in your environment, there will be no connections made, all right? However, if there is a connection made, here we go, we get a good synapse going here, and we have a connection between those distinct parts of the brain and there's evidence of plasticity. So as indicated in your introductory slides, there are many different protective factors and many different risk factors. You yourself, your biology, your psychology, your level of resilience can all serve as protective factors, um, as can your family, um, supportive members, people who are around you who always give you a leg up, uh, the community in which you live in, which tries to protect and nurture you, or does it is it out to get you, right? Or overall society or the global and world stage. All of these different levels um, can serve as protective factors as well as risk factors. Some of the risk factors that we wouldn't you all to reflect upon and to think about what, what role are these different situations, are these different factors playing in your life? Are they risk factors? Are they protective factors? For example, being born low birth weight, if you have insecure attachments, if you didn't nurse and get a high level of oxytoxin, you have no good um, neuroaffective attachment to, between your first caregivers, uh, poor social skills, these can be heavy risk factors. On the other hand, they could be balanced out, neutralized, or become a protective factor if you were able to enhance you know, attachment to family members, if you have good social skills which are modeled within your family context, if you are able to achieve. Um, we know that uh, success begets success. You know, a kid who is told, ah, oh, that's really terrific, you did well on that, will then believe in himself and a child's own self-belief in his ability to learn is one of the key factors in his actual um, you know, learning outcomes. Family factors. Do we have poor parental supervision or do we have supportive and caring uh, family situations? Do we have parents who are abusing substances, drinking too much in the, in the house, smoking too much, drugs? Do we have situations of domestic violence uh, where one spouse is verbally or physically abusing of them? Or are our parents, you know, well employed with respectful jobs? Uh, are we in context of social isolation and do we lack uh, support networks? Or do we have a lot of people out to help us? Do we have good uh, neighbors, good friends in our school? And do we have counselors that are able to, to support kids or ourselves? So family, childhood factors are very important as are school and community factors. We know that as success begets success, failure begets failure. There's a huge downhill cycle. If a kid starts to stop believing in themselves, then they don't do well, which gives them more reason not to believe in themselves, so they don't do well. So the school failure is, um, is a huge risk factor, which leads to other factors, which means that the kid won't learn. Uh, negative peer influences, or a dislike of the school context. Those can be horrible risk factors, as they can be protective factors when you have a good school climate. 
and the community factors, the society or community in which one lives. Uh, if you live in an area that has a high level of neighborhood violence or crime, um, if there are no support services, social or cultural discrimination against individuals, if you don't have authoritative figures or respect, for example, within the police community, for example, those can be terrible risk factors. But they could also be uh, protective factors. If you had good community networking, if people look out for each other, if there's access to different services, if there are community groups, if there are good, healthy recreational after-school programs, for example, many of these things can become protective factors. So there's many risk factors and protective factors. Hopefully you'll take the time to reflect on your own and what are the things that you can work to leverage uh, towards maximizing the, uh, your potential plasticity. And a key example in risk factors has to do with emotions. We know that stress can affect the level of plasticity that your brain is able to produce, as can other social influences on neuroplasticity. So in summary, risk factors and protective factors, you know, you have uh, many different things in the community, social peer, individual characteristics, family factors, uh, political issues, all of these things can have different types of outcomes. Amongst which, the potential to learn, which is, as we said, manifested physiologically in neuroplasticity. So in summary, what did we try to do? We talked about neuroplasticity in the greater level of a transdisciplinary context, understanding the environment, genes, and how that impacts the brain, and all of those things, how they're inter interconnected. We also looked at various definitions of motor-dependent or sleep-dependent plasticity. We considered this concept of critical versus uh, sensitive periods related to plasticity and learning. We looked at three key case studies, and then we talked about protective and risk factors. So what do we want you to do now? As in all weeks, um, we'd like to take questions, and we also want to uh, ask you to please log in and do the 3 one activity right now, uh, in which you tell us three things that you learned from this class, three things you didn't know before we started this lecture. Two things that are so important, you're going to keep uh, looking into them, researching them, or you're going to talk to somebody else about them, tell them about it. And one thing you think you will do to change uh, your personal professional practice based on the information that was shared today. Okay? With that, if you have any questions that come up that aren't able to be talked about directly in this particular forum right now, please shoot me an email and we will be sure to clear those things up. Thank you very much. See you next week.